Where did your time start with, with Harrier? Where did you first meet the Harrier? <laughs> the first time I ever saw a Harrier, uh, and that, by the way, I would like to make this point that there's lots of great airplanes out there, but almost everybody remembers where they were <laughs> uh, and what they were doing the first time they saw a Harrier. I was a midshipman at the United States Naval Academy, and uh, they announced that a Harrier was good. There's a big parade field at the Academy, uh, and they announced that evening uh, dinner that there was going to be a Harrier fly in to, to over the uh, grass field and do a uh, uh, touch and go or a hover. Uh, do some flying and then depart the airplane. So depart the pattern. So uh, I, along with hundreds of other midshipmen, rushed out to the airfield, not knowing what to expect. We'd we'd heard about the hair. We never actually seen one. I'd never actually seen one. And this airplane came in and stopped relatively <laughs> close to where I was. I remember having to hold on to my hat because things were being sand and grass and everything was being blown all over the place, and it was unbelievably loud, but to look up there about 100 feet in the air and see a 12-ton airplane uh, uh, just just motionless there, and he maneuvered it around and uh, then took off like a rocket, uh, I, I didn't really know what to expect, uh, and I, I didn't really know how to digest all the information that I just observed. I did also want to say that the uh, the network connection to Art was not ideal as well, so there will be a bit of a dropout, but we can hear him throughout, so that's the important bit. And what he was saying there, we've all had moments, we all have that moment, don't we, of uh, Harry and Memories, where we first saw the aircraft. Mine are screaming at my sister, unable to hear each other, stood while the Harrier hovered not very far away. Just the sheer noise of the thing, what a, what a beast. Let's get back on with Niles. I continue the conversation by asking about, uh, yeah, his transition to flying the aircraft. Uh, I went through my transition training was, uh, um, and then assigned to VMA 231, uh, the Ace of Spades squadron. And my skipper at the time was W.R. Spicer, uh, legend in the Marine Corps. <laughs> and my welcome aboard was him yelling at me, standing up. The only thing protecting me from physical harm was his desk. He, uh, he threatened to kill me and the checkerboard. <laughs> He actually did throw me out of his office and uh, uh, then made me his assistant <laughs> and, uh, right next to him as the, as the uh, administration officer. And um, uh, he believed that we sh the, the Marines, it had to be a weapon system. You had to be able to deploy. You had to be able to operate from austere sites because he just came out of Vietnam as Force Recon enlisted and then went back and be uh, two tours as a pilot flying helicopters, and we practiced packing up, deploying to some place in the United States, unpacking, operating out of whatever you brought. If you didn't bring it, you didn't have it. You weren't going to go down to Kmart or Walmart or get it. You had to do without. Uh, and next time, don't be so crazy. And um, the uh, uh, pack back up, come back. And then a couple of weeks later, we do the whole thing all over again. We were on ship. We were at airfields. We did. We bombed seven days a week, pretty much seven days a week. Uh, but we, we flew seven days a week. We bombed five days a week while we're back. When, once the week work was over, he had us going across country to get extra flight time because the Harrier does not have very long legs. 45 minutes. Our typical sortie with tanks was 45 minutes, mm -hmm. point 0.8. Um, where somebody flying the A4 would get a 1.2, 1.3. So we weren't building the flight time like the A4 guys were. And he says, the only way you got to do is going across country. So we would go in across country and be expected to come back with at least 10 hours of flight time and, and actually do low level, do low, low level navigation on the cross countries. So that was my first introduction to the Harrier. And it was drinking from a fire hose and doing everything that the airplane could do. And there's an awful and lot. I, that and I tell you what, I, I'm thankful for that because a lot of people didn't get that that trial by fire. Interesting. And it sounds like, yeah, talk about fire. The, 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 the versatility of that aircraft throws an awful lot as a, as a yes. pilot to, to deal yes. with, to learn, to, to manage. Uh, it must have been, yeah, trial by fire indeed. Yeah, interesting. And I can understand having gone through that, how you're then bitter. 
and you're <laughs> you must have fallen in love with that airplane. I did, I did. I've had the great fortune throughout the military to fly. I don't know what the number is. I stopped. I actually stopped counting. I uh, I say the number eighty five. It's probably above that. Uh, somewhere between 85 and 95 different types of airplanes. The Harrier is my absolute favorite. And that's the benchmark that I compare everything else to. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, before I actually flew, I had a chance to talk with John Farley about his philosophy. And I told him I had bought a Sea Harrier and he says, well, you bought the best to breed. Mm -hmm. He said, let me tell you, they're, they're not all the same, but the Sea Harrier in particular, he always, that was his favorite, and it's become my favorite too. The, um, because of the raised canopy, the visibility is a little bit better. He thought the flight controls were a little bit better. I didn't have the, I didn't have the experience at the time as a young lieutenant flying to real, like, but now I, know, I know now having flown the AV-8B and the Sea Harrier and the AV-8A, the Sea Harrier, uh, I can hover it hands off. Um, trim it up and just take my hands right off the stick and it'll hover um, just fine. And the, uh, it drifts with the wind a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> and um, I really, really, really do like the way it flies. Tell me about the restoration, and I call it a restoration, but bringing that aircraft back to flying it, status. It, the restoration, might, restoration may be inaccurate. It mm -hmm. was uh, preparation for civilian flight because um, the outside of the airplane looks basically stock. Okay, we were missing a few parts that, that uh, a pylon cover, we made one of those out of some fiberglass, that's, that's non structural or whatnot. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we took out a lot of extra uh, uh, wiring that we didn't need. I think it was 40 or 50 pounds of wiring. It didn't have a it doesn't have a radar in the nose. So we had to replace that with about 66 pounds of ballast. Uh, to get it to where, well, actually we started with 80 and then I, I took some of it out. I didn't like the way it flew. Um, and we've got a civilian radio, civilian GPS. We took the head up display out after the very first flight. It, it did not work and it was 48 pounds of extra weight uh, that uh, if it's not gonna work, we're not gonna put it in there. And my landing aid, uh, a lot of the F-30 pilots, 530 pilots are a lot of suppressor. I've got a piece of black tape across the windscreen <laughs> that setting on the ground statically will be this far below the horizon. And I, I just put it on the horizon. The, the airplane doesn't care what airspeed it lands at. It, it could land at zero or 180 knots, just as long as it's at this attitude and the main gear touches down, touches down first. Um, and so I just set the attitude and roll the airplane on the ground. That's the way I fly it. Fantastic. And it must have been, I mean, there is still great love for the Harrier in the UK, of course, but in America as well, the reception must have been amazing taking that aircraft around the, uh, the air shows around the US. We're the rock star at the air show. Mm -hmm. the, it's not, it's, there's no question about it. Um, to the point that one of the first air shows we did, um, we were getting ready to, to fly and there was a civilian performer flying. Uh, just as soon as we started the APU, the cr you can, it's a noticeable sound. The crowd started like a tsunami. I was unaware, I was oblivious to it because I'm going through checks and looking at temperatures and stuff. But one of my buddies was an observer and he just watched the way the crowd came over there. People were coming out of the porta potties. <laughs> they were getting out of line to get a corn dog. And they just, a tsunami of people that came over there to watch us. And we later became aware that that's, um, that's unfair of us to some of my friends that are performing. <laughs> you know, that, that uh, there's some of my friends too, and they're doing a good job and they're up there. So, so we actually, we modified the way we do this. We tend to be off to the side or something or make that part of the, uh, um, make sure that the, the air boss knows that, that as soon as we hit that start button, the crowd's going to stop paying attention to the other performers and they're going to be looking at this. So we build that, actually build that into the schedule and we can start, go through our checks in about, a, in about two minutes. It's under two minutes because there's not, there's, I don't have any INS to align. I'm not, not any weapon systems to arm. 
By the time the engine's running, the GPS is already up. We do go through the functional checks of making sure we don't have any leaks, nothing's on fire, and the hydraulic system's working away. But basically, I'm ready. As soon as I start, I'm ready to taxi. So we just we modified our start procedure to uh, uh, to not infringe upon another pilot's time when they're flying. All good things must come to an end then, and uh, I know the, the aircraft are now up for sale. Are, you, are they? When's the last time the aircraft flew? Well, there's an interested buyer from the UK. Uh -huh. uh, there are a couple. There were a couple from the United States that um, we put them on the market at the wrong time with COVID. That shut down the air show industry and made it absolutely clear to the broker. I wasn't going to sell the airplane to anybody just because they could write a check for it. Uh, it had to be the right person. It had to be the right person that could, uh, I could pass the torch to that, that I could, while I can uh, still legally train somebody to fly, I could teach them to handle the airplane safely and competently and would be part of the deal as a consultant, as an advisor, as a ground observer, uh, in some capacity like that. Um, but it wasn't going to be just someone with an ego and a checkbook that I was going to sell to. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't going to happen. And um, uh, we've had a couple interested persons from the United States. Uh, we had two calls on one day recently, actually. And that got me thinking, it's been on the market for a while. And now we get two calls in one day. What is happening on the international market that would stimulate that interest? And um, uh, I, I, I think that drove more interest in the two-seater. The two-seater, I think, is really the valuable part of this. We're very close to flying. Uh, there's, no re there's no reason we cannot fly it. The U.S. government's going to let us do it. We've got experience in doing it. It's not a, it's not a new thing. And uh, we've, got, we've got everything we need to get that airplane in the air. We've just sort of stalled it for the past couple of years due to finances and some other stuff. We've got ejection seats. We've got... Um, we were we had some problems with the hydraulic uh, actuators for the ailerons. We got those. We got we got new ones of those and installed, and that's quite a job. We've uh, installed our emergency blowdown system. So the two seater is the real value of the package in my mind because that would allow me to safely train somebody so they could fly. And we're making the cockpits identical. The front cockpit of the two-seater will be the same as the single-seater, so that it would be transparent. Well, it's interesting you mentioned a, you know, an interested party in the UK. I can certainly imagine a few people in the UK who might be interested, but what would stop the Sea Harrier flying in the UK? Are you familiar enough with the regulations well, over here? Dan Griffith and I tried this uh, several years ago. Um, we, we petitioned the... Um, CAA to bring it back and fly it and we had a large package and they asked a bunch of questions we had to analyze acts uh, at previous accidents what happened what caught what's been fixed to uh, to prevent that again and um, it all hinged on um, original contractor support yeah. from they used the, the question the question was who was going to support this and <laughs> I'm not sure we understood what the question was for support. They, what they meant by that was Rolls-Royce and British Aerospace. And the Hunter accident, uh, Rolls-Royce had, it's my understanding, they had 11 lawsuits for an airplane they hadn't touched and didn't have any responsibility for over decades, yet they were still sued by that. So... Um, and you could probably throw Martin Baker into the, uh, into the mix with that as well, that uh, they would be terrified of a lawsuit should something happen. And my response to that was, well, can we sign away, the, can we release liability in some way, some, have a lawyer draw up some document, and I'll sign it, that, uh, uh, that I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and when we purchased the two-seater, 
the uh, there was an original clause in that document that we needed to obtain an insurance policy to indemnify the uh, seller on the order of a hundred million pounds. And that seems like a large number to me. <laughs> yes. uh, and we were, we were, we were able to remove that clause because first of all, I don't think you could get it. And second of all, the cost would be unbelievably prohibitive. So it may or may not happen. It would take, um, it would take a change in mindset, I would think. And maybe that's happened now because there's a couple of people trying to fly a two seater in the UK. Uh, maybe things have changed. Maybe people say, well, based on what these guys have done in the United States, and we're hoping that that, <coughs> that, our, that our record of 14 years of doing it can help build a, a, a case. We, if we fly it different than the mil military does. Uh, first of all, we're not gonna do an air show in bad weather. The air, very few air shows are done off of a carrier launch. Uh, <laughs> very, and, and the emergency procedure really for almost everything is stop and land. We could have an emergency, and we've had one during an actual air show where we stopped and landed. The crowd didn't know any difference. The um, uh, because you come into a hover and you land and say, "Well, the air show is a little shorter today," and it the crowd doesn't know any different. They still think it was a great air show. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time. I hope uh, people. I know that people will have enjoyed this tremendously. So thank you for uh, filling in a little bit of the hole that the air show season has sadly left us this year. Well, it's been my pleasure, and I'll tell you what, the air show, see, the air show uh, industry is going to come back. It's just a, this is a speed bump. That's, you just have to get through this. A, a vaccine is on the horizon, um, and it'll be no different than any other uh, illnesses out there. Get vaccinated for it, and you'll be good to go. Air show season will be back. People will be able to social distance. I mean, uh, be able to get together without social distancing. Um We'll get through all this stuff and we'll return. There'll be a lot of great airplanes and great performers out there uh, while in the crowds, just like we've done before. Fantastic. It's a wonderful note of optimism to end. Thank you again, Art, for the time. And uh, yeah, we'll chat again soon, I hope. You're welcome. Take care.